Are nudges and other behavioral interventions ethical? Well, in this video, I'm going to give you my opinion as somebody who designs behavioral interventions for a living. Let's get into it. So maintains freedom of choice. That's characteristic of a nudge. You want a slightly uglier version of yourself. And I think that areas of experts are quite funny. Nudging is done by what we call a choice architect, which is a fancy term for anyone who influences the choices that you make. Okay, so to answer this question, I kind of need to say what a behavioral intervention actually is. And defining behavioral interventions is difficult because they come in so many different shapes and sizes. But I'll do my best. So to me, a behavioral intervention is any deliberate change to a decision maker's environment in order to make it more likely for them to make one decision or one behavior over another. Now, what those decisions and behaviors are depends on the client and the type of problem that we get. So I'm gonna give you a few examples to get your brain working. For example, some clients might want us to increase their attention on a subscription plan. So for them, we might look at insights like loss aversion or sunk cost bias, for example, and then off the back of that insight, develop some sort of loyalty rewards that disappear if people cancel. This way, people are encouraged to make the most of their loyalty benefits and therefore makes canceling less attractive. Now, we're not preventing people from canceling. People still have free will to stay on the plan or cancel, but by using our understanding of psychology and choice architecture, we can make the option of staying on the plan seem more attractive. Another example, which is actually a case study from Ogilvy, is increasing charitable donations by redesigning the envelope that the charity Christian Aid gives out to people. By making the envelope slightly thicker, this acted as what behavioral scientists call a costly signal. In other words, it's a signal to people donating that Christian Aid is a quality organization so good that they can give out high quality envelopes. And this subtle change in envelope design actually increased charitable donations by 14%. So just from those two examples, you can see that there are already some ethical questions that are coming up. So let's explore those questions. But before we do, I should say that all of these opinions are my own and not necessarily reflective of Ogilvy or my coworkers. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay, so the first question to answer is, are behavioral interventions inherently unethical? There are certainly some people who think so. They feel very uncomfortable that their decision-making might be swayed one way or the other by people like me. But in my opinion, they aren't inherently unethical. We're not taking away anybody's free will. We're not taking away anybody's you know, right to freedom of choice. We're simply changing the way that those choices are presented to people to make it more likely for them to choose one over the other. So the way that I see behavioral interventions is that behavioral science is really just a tool and no tool is inherently unethical or ethical. It's what you do with it that matters. In the same way that a hammer can be used to build houses for the homeless or it can be used as a powerful weapon. And so the tool itself cannot be inherently unethical. So then you have to ask the question, so what is it then that would make an intervention ethical or unethical? And for me, there are three different factors that you have to consider. The first is of course, intention and outcome. So, you know, what is it that you're trying to achieve and what is it that is actually achieved at the end? Are you helping people reduce their carbon footprint or are you turning people into gambling addicts? These are two different uses of behavioral science, but one inherently feels much more ethical than the other because one is helping people and the other is harming people. And so what the desired outcome and actual outcome of a project is, of course, will have a huge determinant on whether or not that behavioral intervention is ethical. So the next thing you have to consider when you're deciding whether something is ethical or unethical is the scale that you're working at. One of the biggest shocks for me coming out of university and going into the private sector was the difference in scale. The private sector works on a much larger scale than in academia. When I was a student at university, our studies would typically have maybe a few hundred participants at best. And those participants would normally be mostly students probably taking some kind of survey. And then once they take the survey, they resume their normal life and it's like nothing ever happened. But when it comes to the private sector, the scale we're working on is much, much larger. Typically, our behavioral interventions are going to be exposed to thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of people across the world. And so the potential for harm, but also the potential for good is much, much larger. And so for me, that means that the ethical consideration also has to be scaled accordingly. And you really have to be careful with what kind of interventions you're developing, because if you develop something which is going to hurt people, you're potentially hurting a lot of people. People. It's kind of like the trolley problem. It matters that there are five people on one of the tracks. And the final factor that plays into whether something is ethical or not, and this is probably the most contentious one, is just 
opinion. What I regard as ethical might not be regarded as ethical by somebody else and vice versa. For example, recently I've started to care a lot about alcohol and its place in society and the harm that can be caused when people drink too much. And so for me personally at work, I made the request to not be put on any projects that are for alcohol companies and are promoting the consumption of alcohol. Now that's my personal ethical moral compass that's guiding that decision making for me. But you know, that's not necessarily shared by all of my co-workers and definitely not by all other consultancies across the world. On the flip side, one of my co-workers might care a lot about animal rights and they don't believe that we should be eating animals for example and so if we get a project from a client like KFC where they want us to get people to eat more fried chicken then maybe they don't want to encourage that because they don't believe that people should be eating meat and that's their ethical and moral compass guiding their decision whereas for me I would personally have no ethical problems encouraging people to eat KFC I like eating KFC myself. So in the current state of the industry people's personal opinion people's personal moral compass does play a huge determining factor over what interventions get made and what don't. Okay, so with so much variation in ethical and moral standards between practitioners and between consultancies, you may say, well, Pete, surely there should be some kind of regulatory body that regulates the kind of nudges that go out into the world. And in theory and on paper, this sounds great until you get into the nitty gritty of how you'd actually carry out one of these bodies. Who would be the people in charge of doing this regulation? Who would fund them? What would their incentives be to work quickly and efficiently. Working quickly and efficiently is so important in the private sector because at the end of the day, we're a business. Clients are paying us to produce results quickly. And if we increase our costs and that reduces the amount of clients that will be able to afford us, and it will also reduce the attractiveness of the proposition, meaning that we'll just have less work and less nudges will be put out into the world in general. Now, reducing the total number of nudges that go out into the world would be good if all of the nudges we were doing were harmful or net negative on society. But actually, in my experience at working at Ogilvy, and I can't speak for other consultancies, but in my experience, the nudges that we work on and the projects that we work on are actually very pro-social, that are, they are generally very good for society. For example, if I just think about the projects that I'm working on, I'm working on reducing harm from smoking, I'm working on reducing binge eating of sugary snacks, I'm working on reducing food waste. And so if I'm successful in these projects, this could be a very large net positive effect on the world. And regulation would mean that less of this positive effect would actually go out into the world. Okay, so a good way to think about this, I think, is if you imagine two parallel universes 10 years in the future. So one parallel universe is one where a regulatory body was set up today, and then the other parallel universe is one where we carry on like now, where we have no regulatory body over nudges that go into the world. What would those two worlds look like? Would one be better than the other? And what would be the effect of the behavioral science industry on that world? And I would argue that the more work that behavioral scientists can do, the more positive effect that we can have on the world. And I would hope and predict, given my experience in the industry so far, that in 10 years time, a world without a regulatory body would have a greater net positive effect on the world than one with one. But that's just my current opinion. That opinion might change. I'm also keen to hear your opinion. So if you think differently, let me know in the comments below. I hope this video can be a starting point, a conversation starter for people to uh, talk about the ethics of nudging. Um, I also want to give a shout out to a really good ethical framework, which is called the For Good Framework, which I think tackles most of the main questions that practitioners like myself should be asked before they develop a behavioral intervention. So I'll put a link to that in the description as well. Okay, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.